Jesus. You think about that song and the image I selected for the screen is really one that I think about in a spiritual sense. That is the race that we face in this life, the race of faith. Remember Paul talks about he has, he has kept the faith, he has finished the race, he has, he has kept his faith, he has reached, you might say, the finish line in a spiritual sense. He has done that which is pleasing in the sight of God. You think about that idea that Jesus is for you. I think sometimes if we're not careful, we forget how much Christ wants us to have heaven as our home. We think about the commands of the Bible. We know the Bible tells us that His commands are not burdensome, that they are not, you might say, overwhelming. But sometimes it seems if we're not careful, we forget just how badly Christ wants us to have heaven as our home. Because the world is around us, you know, we have so much going on sometimes, we forget just how much the Lord loves us. Yes, yeah, Brother Smith read for us just a moment ago, there in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, where he says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. That is, that the Lord is not, it's not that the Lord is not going to keep His promise, or that He's taken a long time to fulfill His promise. He says, As some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, if you think about that, if the Lord was not long-suffering, the Lord was not patient, if He was not enduring, there would be a lot of folks today who would not have eternal life. Because he, if He was not long-suffering, the Lord could have returned a long time ago. But as we notice there in verse 9, He says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. You think about that idea of long-suffering toward us, we know that mankind and has been since the very beginning, really, since Adam and Eve, have been those who have fallen short, those who have done those things which are not pleasing the sight of God. And it's for that reason I think we should be very thankful, very grateful, that the Lord is indeed long-suffering toward us. Sometimes we fail to think of what part we have in our own salvation. Christ did His part, and as you're going to see this morning, we have to do ours as well. Let's begin by looking at the idea how Jesus wants you to have eternal life. That's why He died on the cross. Now I put out there this morning, and I'll keep them out there for as long as anyone uses them, a little sheet of paper where you can take notes, where I ask you what you can write down, what the main points are of each lesson, and lessons learned and things like that, designed just simply to help you learn all you can from the lessons I've presented, any lesson that's presented uh, here from the pulpit. I just want to make mention that before I got going too far. But you think about our first point this morning. Jesus wants you to have eternal life. That's why He died on the cross. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. We find in Luke chapter 19, in verse 10, the Bible says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the whole purpose. And continues to be the whole purpose of Christ. You remember that Christ was in existence long before He ever came to the earth. John chapter 1 tells us that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, reference to Christ. Now it goes on to talk about how He even had a part in creation. Nothing was made that was made without Him. He had a part in creation. So we know that Christ was always in existence with God. And that tells us that when Christ came to the earth, He left perfection. He left what we would literally consider, He left literally heaven to come to earth. You think about that idea, leaving heaven a place where God is, where there's no temptations, no one, there's no one in heaven you know, defying you. When we came to earth, He found all those things. He found temptation, the Bible tells us, He is tempted in the like manner as we are, yet without sin. He was mocked, he was hated, so he left perfection to come to the earth. And the Bible tells us in verse 10 why. He has come to seek and to save that which was lost. All that Christ did was for us. All that the Bible teaches, as we'll see later, is for us. The whole purpose of Christ was to save mankind. And we see in John 15 and verse 5 that without Christ, mankind is without hope. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. 
So that tells us if we do not abide in Christ, who is the vine, as he says in verse 5, then we cannot bear much fruit. We cannot do anything, he says. Unlike the denominational world, the branches, of course, we recognize are not different churches. They are not denominations. They are members, individual persons, who are part of the vine, which is Christ. And so we see, he says, I am the vine. You, talking to who? The people. That tells us who the branches are. That's not really that difficult to figure out. You are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. So if we abide in Christ, and we are attached to the vine, that is, we are faithfully following God, we can do a lot. He says, can bear much fruit. But without me, if we're not attached to the vine, we're not a part of the vine, we can do nothing. If you take a tree branch and you break a part of it off, a little, you know, like a little extension of the branch, another piece of the branch that extends off, you break it off, you throw it on the ground, what's going to happen? It's going to die. The part you broke off and fell on the ground is going to dry up, it's going to eventually rot, it's going to decay, it's going to eventually disappear over time. Because apart from what? Being attached to the true branch, the true vine, it's going to dry up and wither. It cannot do anything. You think about, for those of you who have gardens, you have vegetables, you have fruits. As soon as it pops off that vine, it falls off that tree, you have a short period of time before you can take part of it, right? Because once it takes, comes off that vine, what happens? It begins to die. It begins to decay. It begins to slowly rot. And so when Brother Dennis gave us some cantaloupe here a few weeks ago, we began eating that pretty quickly because you don't want to waste it. Because once it's taken off, it has a short time period before, while it's good. Well, the same idea of spirits, as soon as you are off the vine, you begin to die. Christ says, without me, you can do nothing. We know also that Christ has paid the price for sins, which we could not pay. You know, the Bible tells us, we'll see in a moment, that sin comes with a price. The law of sin and death is very simple. We find in the Old Testament, you sin against God, you die. That's why they offered up sacrifices, so they would not die being guilty of their sins. They would not die that spiritual death. But we think about this, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, he says, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. That should make our Catholic friends think about that when they try to pay the priest to pray someone out of purgatory or out of hell, wherever it is they may pray them out of. You cannot do that. The Bible tells us very specifically, you cannot be redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. He says, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But with what? How are you redeemed? He says, with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest at these last times for you. Foreordained from the foundation of the world, meaning from the very beginning, this is part of God's plan. This is what's going to happen. That Christ is going to die on the cross. He was foreordained. He was pre-appointed to this. Verse 21 who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory. So through Christ we what? We believe in God. That's why Christ says, if you see, the, see me, you've seen the Father. He raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory so that your faith and hope are what? Are in God. Through Christ we know God. Through Christ we should believe in God because Christ is from God. Christ was with God. He's with God now. And so through Him, He says, so that your faith and hope are in God. As a result of being redeemed from the blood of Christ, our faith and hope are in God. Why? Because it's God who sent Christ to the earth. It's Christ who's called the Son of God. And so our faith should be in God because of what Christ has done for us, knowing God through Christ. You think about this, without the proper sacrifice for sins, we cannot be pleasing to God. In the Old Testament, they have their sacrifices to have their sins forgiven. In the New Testament, we find in Romans chapter 6, for instance, that sin has always had a price. Romans 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. What's the last part of that verse say? Well, the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin has always had a price. 
You go back to Adam and Eve, when, when Eve was deceived by the serpent, and likewise so was Adam, and they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, what price was their sin? They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And the Bible goes on to talk about how Eve would have to, what, suffer through childbirth, how Adam would have to work and have to and, and till and grow things, but he basically lived by the sweat of his brow. Because in the Garden of Eden, before sin, they were very pampered people. But sin, like we see so many times, it ruins everything, doesn't it? It ruins it. And those of you who have gardens know how important it is. When you think about how the Bible talks about the Garden of Eden, how there was a mist that came up from the, from the ground. And how much work you had to put in to have that, those gardens grow. And how fragile they are by the weather, the cold, the hot, the rain, the no rain, all those things. And you think about what was Adam's charge in the Garden of Eden? To tend the garden. Which basically means, you think about it, he had a very easy task. I think about how basically he just went about and made sure that he picked things when they grew. And he didn't have really a whole lot at all. Because you read about what, what happened afterwards, things became a lot more difficult. Now he has those thorns, those thistles, those weeds, all that stuff you spray and try to kill year after year. Well, Adam would have to deal with that as well. And so sin had a price. For Adam and Eve, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They would have to work. And basically their whole life really would change. And so it, was for, for, so it would for mankind as well. Jesus wants you to know how to obey today. That's why we have the Bible. And the Bible literally means the book of books. And so that's why we have the book of books. The book that contains all the books really of God. From Genesis through Revelation. 2 Timothy tells us, as we'll see in a moment, that all those things were given to us by inspiration of God. And so the reason we have the Bible that has survived thousands of years, more copies of New Testament, Old Testament texts than any other ancient writing ever. You know, people love Shakespeare and Plato. But when you compare how many of their writings have been found to the New Testament and the Old Testament scriptures have been found, they don't even break the... I mean, it's, you talk about 60s probably to compare to New Testament texts, it's in the thousands. Why is that? Because God doesn't just preserve His text. He wants to show you how different it is from everything else. You have a few of these, you have a few of these, and you have the Bible. There's a reason why you have that many. To show how clearly God wants us to know what it, we need to do to be pleasing in His sight. God has given us His Word, and that Word saves. Look at 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 and 17. The Bible says, all Scripture, you notice all, not just the red text, and you have those red, those Bibles have the words of Christ in red. Well, in all reality, they're all in red, aren't they? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration means breathed out, so God breathed those things out. And it's profitable, it is good for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And he tells us why. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, if you go out to your yard, and you get out your grass trimmer, you get out your mower, and you go to crank on that mower, it doesn't start, and you realize you don't have gas in it, you're not thoroughly equipped, are you? You don't have everything you need. And it seems that that at least happens to me a few times every summer season. I go out and I'm not thoroughly equipped. I go to go get gasoline, go to get, you know, grass trimmer line or whatever the case may be. But you think about the Bible, it has given us everything we need. We don't need the additional writings of men like the books of Mormon, the pearl of great price, and all the other nonsense that comes from man. You look at verse 17, that the man of God may be complete. If we needed any other book, then this verse would be a lie, wouldn't it? If we didn't read any other man's writings to know what God wants us to do, then the word of God is not complete. But we know since all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and since the very next verse tells us that we have, he says that man of God may be complete, God has just told us he's just, that he has given us everything we need. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, not just equipped, but thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
The Bible is from God. It is not the word of man. After all, it is not a man to save himself. Think about Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. O Lord, I know the way of man is not himself. It is not a man who walks to direct his own steps. Man does not always have the greatest ideas, do they? We know that from our government. They don't always have the greatest ideas. They cannot get us into the gates of heaven. But we see in, in Jeremiah 10, 23, it says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. He's saying, I cannot get to heaven by my own ideas, my own traditions, my own way of thinking. Because you remember David had his own way of thinking. It led to sin, didn't it? His move to number the people of God, his move to commit sin, and on and on. You think about this, so he says, it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. He means he's saying that we need someone to guide us and it's not ourselves. We need God to guide us. And we know He does that today through His Word. And when we think about that, we know that God in Christ <clears throat> has given us all we need today in His Word. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of whom He called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. What are those exceeding great and pr precious promises? Well, those would include that when you die faithful to God, you're going to have heaven as your home. It's a promise. It is a guarantee. It's not a possibility. It is guaranteed. He goes on to say in verse 4 that, that through these that you, that you may be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption as in the world through the lust. We can have heaven as our home. We follow the Word of God that we know supplies everything we need. It is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You know, I'm amazed still when people say, well, or say things to the idea that, well, the Bible just doesn't really talk about this. Well, we need to really think about that. Does the Bible talk about everything? Absolutely. You know, the Bible doesn't have to use the words like pot, or crack, or abortion to cover those things. Because we read verses that tell us things about those who shed innocent blood, those who commit adultery, fornication, drinking parties, and Paul says, and the like, will not hear the kingdom of God. Does God's word cover all those things? Absolutely, every single one of them. And so God has given us everything that we need. The Word of God still guides us today. Think about this from Psalm 119 and verse 169. He says, Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your Word. God, he ha He's asking for understanding, but He doesn't want it from man. He doesn't want man's advice or man's opinion. He wants God's direction, He says in verse 169. Give me understanding according to your Word. Guide me according to your word. So we have seen that Christ wants us to have eternal life. That's why he died on the cross. Jesus wants us to know how to obey today. That's why we have the Bible. But also we have to remember that Christ has done all he can is up to us now. We have to do something. We have to make sure that we are living a life that's pleasing to God. Just because Christ died on the cross, as we read about in John 3, verse 16, for God saw the world that He gave His only begotten Son, to whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because Christ died on the cross, there's no reason for someone to lose their eternal soul. But they do. Every day. We have those who are going against God, going against uh, the Bible, and doing so going against God. And when they do those things, just because Christ died on the cross doesn't mean they're going to have eternal life. It requires obedience. It requires action. Christianity is a life that requires action, doesn't it? If we want to be pleasing to God, we have to do things. We cannot sit back and say, well, I've been baptized. I don't do anything else now. Look at Galatians chapter 1. 
We know that some are quick to turn away from Christ and the true gospel. Galatians 1 verses 6 and 7 says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. You know, we think about this, there is no gospel, that's, or a different gospel. That's what Paul says in verse 7. He says, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you. You want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And I've always believed, ever since I was converted, as you read the Bible and take it for what it says, as Brother Sullins from BIM would say, the Bible says what it means, and it means what it says. That the Word of God is really not that complicated. There may be verses that we don't understand, but when we st step back and we read and we study, we think on those things, take a little more time, we can even learn those difficult passages. Because the Word of God is not difficult. You know what? In Acts chapter 2, when Peter preaches that sermon, and they come before him and say, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What Peter said wasn't complicated. It wasn't some deep theological idea it was simple, basic teachings that came straight from God. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for, for the purpose of remission of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is not a difficult verse to understand. We have those, as, we, as he mentions here, he, he says in verse 7, what you want to take you and, and teach you a different gospel, he says in verse 7, which is not another. There's only one truth, isn't there? There's only one Christ. There's only one Father, God of all. There's only one Holy Spirit, as we read about there uh, from the letter of Paul. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God, one Father of all, who is above all, through all, in you all. All those things. One, 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 all throughout that. And then we hear those who say, well, I believe. Or my preacher says this. At our bug man say the other day, you don't like to be called pastor, do you? And I said, well, I like to be called a, a biblical name. I'm just a preacher. Well, you can call me Russ. It doesn't matter. We don't need preacher or minister or evangelist. We don't need all those things. Now, he wasn't interested in talking about anything else, really, but... When we think about it, the world today has a lot of different ideas. But we cannot be persuaded to follow along, go along with them, just to spare feelings. We have to make sure, as we see here in verse 7, that we are not persuaded to follow a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some, he says in verse 7, who trouble you and want to pervert, want to change, want to alter the gospel of Christ. The faithful clings to the true gospel and not the false gospels we sometimes see today. As you think about this, it is up to us to hold to the truth. God cannot make you be faithful. God cannot make you do that which is right. God cannot make you do anything. You know, some, would, as we know too well, believe that when you're born and you're born saved or lost, that's not found in the Bible. That completely defeats Christ's purpose of coming to the earth. If we were born and saved or lost, why would Christ even come? It makes no sense. But we know this, Christ cannot make us do anything. God cannot make us study as we should. God cannot make us love Him as we should. God cannot make us re-examine our own priorities as we should. Think about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and in which you stand, by which you also are saved. If you hold, if you hold fast, that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. What's he wanting them to do? He says, Hold fast. I've seen different movies with pirates, and they have on their hands, hold fast. I always kind of laugh, and that looks so silly. But the idea is, they want this idea of holding on with both hands. And with Christ and the gospel, we have to hold on with both hands. And hold on to that which is the truth. Look at 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. He says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me, and faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That word pattern there scares people today. Do you know that? There's not a pattern of worship in the Bible. 
There's not a pattern of how we to do things in the Bible, yet that's what Paul's talking about. He says the pattern of sound words. He says the same thing. He talks about follow my example. As what? As a pattern. He says what? Follow our examples. You have us as a pattern of what? Of good works. There is a clear and cut pattern in the Bible. And we are to follow it. He says hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and in love which are in Christ Jesus. Hold fast what? The sound words which he says basically come from God. They're not from him. His example is not based on what he thinks is right. It's based on what Christ has commanded. And in doing so, we can follow his example and follow his words, which, as we know, come from God. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. There again is the idea of holding fast to something. Our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. There is your example. He was tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Now because we're human beings, because we're not perfect, because we're not Christ, there are many times we do sin. But we can follow his example on how he overcame it and how we can endure it and how we can be faithful to God. We know from Matthew chapter 4, whenever Christ was tempted by Satan those three times, he responded each and every time with what? It is written. When people today ask you, why don't you go out and do this with us? Why don't we go out and have a, have a drink? Why don't we go to this party? Why don't we go to this club, whatever the case may be? We can say, well, the Bible says such and such, and so that would be wrong. That's what Christ did. It is written. He did the same thing. The Bible says no. And so when we do that, we respond the same way that Christ did. We must hold fast to the one true gospel day if we are to have salvation. You know, as we close this morning, we know that Christ has done so much for us, and that's a huge understatement. That's why I'm disappointed sometimes when I see those who find better things to do when they could be coming together to worship and to study the Bible with their saints. I think about those who know that there's opportunities to which they can be a part of to learn and grow about God, and grow and learn in God, and yet they do not choose to come. I think about gospel meetings that are poorly attended, lectureships that are poorly attended, I don't mean but just because of other congregations that do not come. I mean by the, we will not call it the hosting congregation. And we can't even get our own people to come. You know, that's sad. That's something we should think about. That's not a problem with a local congregation. That's a problem with our own hearts, isn't it? How many times have we had chances to learn about God and we've decided that there's something else I'd rather do? You know, we think about what Christ has done for us. He has given us so very much. But think about how much do we give back to Him? Some may ask, well, how do we give back to God? Well, the contribution. Well, that's part of it. We're talking about more than that, though, aren't we? We're talking about how much time we spend trying to do all we can to learn about God. To come together with the saints. You know, I think about the preachers I mean, we have in Locust Grove, and this year I've attended less than I've been able to in the, future, in the past. Various things have come up, but I always enjoy being able to go. Vance and I and Alan and several others sometimes go to those meetings. And we have preachers from, of course, from Locust Grove, Brother Keith Cagle, Steve from Sheldo, Brother Dan from Wagner, and Steve Stenzel from Jay and other locations. Too many to, to I can't remember them all now. But when we all come together, you know what? We're always glad we're there. It may be difficult to cut out time to hurry and get things done so we can make time to be at that event. But you know, every time we're there, I think we always enjoy it. Because we're like-minded in faith. We encourage one another. We tease one another. Because that's what preachers do. But we always build one another up. And I think about as us as Christian individuals, we don't have to have a, quote, meeting. But anytime saints come together to study, to, to grow, I think we need to think about how we can be a part of that. Christ has done so much for us. Are you doing all you can to remain faithful? 
Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Here Paul says to those in Philippi, Therefore, but my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. So he's saying not just when I'm there. Because, you know, it's kind of like the child who behaves when their mom and dad are around. When they leave, they act like a crazy person. He says, As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying it's up to you. He cannot hold their hands and make them be faithful to God. We cannot make anyone do that which is needed, but we can encourage them and pray for them. But you know what? When it comes down to it, it's up to us to be how, decide how faithful we're going to be and to show how dedicated or how not dedicated we are to God. As we close this morning, we know that sometimes, I think all of us who are here are Christians, we know that sometimes that we make mistakes. Maybe we allow ourselves to become lax in our dedication to God. But you know, it's not so much about, we have to think about, it's not so much about what others think of us. I think we all agree we want others to think well of us, but we want, to think, we want God to think well of us. We want God to see our dedication to Him. Christians who, who have sinned their life, as we see from Acts 17, verse 20, must repent of their sins. If we have done something that's sinful, we need to repent of those things. And then we also need to pray that God will forgive us and pray that we will be a better servant for Him. This morning, as you think on these things, if you have any needs or concerns, you can come forward now. That's good that we stand and sing to encourage you.